Joining us now to analyze today's headlines is Christina Mislan, Assistant Professor of Journalism Studies at the Missouri School of Journalism. Hi, Christina. Hello, Sanaa. Yemen's news service has announced this morning that warplanes dropping bombs on Sana'a resulted in at least 20 deaths and 50 injuries. Yemenis on the ground said at least 8 to 10 people had been killed. A number of people were trapped under rubble and medical personnel were working to rescue them. Saudi Arabia, with logistical support from the U.S., has been waging a relentless war on Yemen in retaliation for takeover by Houthi rebels. Meanwhile, the House Armed Services Committee yesterday voted to authorize $200 million in U.S. support for the Ukrainian government fighting against Russia and Russian-backed rebels. Committee members would like it to fund lethal weapons of a defensive nature. Some U.S. troops are already in Ukraine to provide training. Christina, do these two stories illustrate to you how destructive U.S. military force and political influence are around the world? Well, definitely. I think not only it's destructive in terms of producing violence, but I think what we can see is inability to move forward from this historical past. So, for instance, on the one hand, you have a Saudi-led coalition, which is also helped by the U.S. selling weapons to coalition states. And any time, as we have seen, that the U.S. has intervened in the Middle East, historically, the consequences have been exacerbated. On the other hand, you have the U.S. has its hands in Ukraine, which, of course, should also be concerning, because what I see is an extension of Cold War politics. So anytime I hear anti-Russian aggression discourse, I also hear communist aggression rhetoric. And so what we have here is this language that's West versus East, which is often equated to good versus evil. Then you have the U.S. versus Russia, which is also reminiscent of this battle for imperialism that consumed both states during the 20th century. Right. So I think we need to look at the violence and the political rhetoric that's happening. And a new study released today has found that the cost of renting homes in the United States has jumped significantly, adding to the financial burden most ordinary Americans face. The nonprofit group Enterprise Community Partners analyzed census data to find that more than a quarter of Americans are now spending at least half their income on rent each month. It's a number that has risen 26 percent since 2007. The reasons for this statistic include increased demand for rental housing due to foreclosures and stagnant wages that have not kept up with rising rents. The editorial board of the New York Times today, on May Day, published an op-ed criticizing low wages, saying, quote, low-wage employers in particular pay low wages because they can, and the main reason they can is that Congress has failed over decades to adequately update the minimum wage and other labor standards. Christina, does it seem as though the fight for a higher minimum wage is permeating enough into the mainstream now that we might see federal action? Well, we hope so. At least if the New York Times is writing an editorial about it, it has, brought, has moved into some sort of mainstream conversation. But I do think we should be skeptical. We see this happen with conversations about immigration reform, for example. So mainstream conversations seem to support a huge reform, but then political interests get in the way. And then basically we still end up where we are today without any progress on that front. And so I think in the case, for instance, of corporate interests, once corporations who benefit from corporate welfare get into the conversation and then you have lobbyists who start moving in, well, then the conversation gets co-opted. And so then 2020 passes and we're left with even worse problems. And finally, the House Judiciary Committee just passed a bill overhauling the USA Patriot Act. The bill would curb the sweeping up of metadata by the National Security Agency that so many Americans were appalled to discover through the revelations of whistleblower Edward Snowden. It would also end the Orwellian practice by the FBI of sending national security letters and afford limited oversight of the secret FISA courts. The bill has bipartisan support and heads to the House for a full vote where it is likely to pass. Even in the Senate, a similar bill is gaining traction, but hardliners like Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell are intent on keeping the Patriot Act intact. McConnell may be fighting a losing battle. Christina, even though this is a very modest bill that would only curb a metadata collection and, and a few other things, does it count as a small victory for civil liberties and privacy rights? And should we be surprised that uh, it's Republicans that are leading this fight? I do think it counts as a small victory, although we know it doesn't go nearly far enough. But, you know, this question about Republicans leading the fight is an interesting one. Now that the Senate is Republican-controlled, We've seen several bipartisan bills being passed this year. And last year, however, it seemed many bills with similar popularity were being held up. So I do think we need to see recent trends as very careful strategic moves. So the Republican Party has refused to cooperate in Democratic Senate-controlled environment. And so 
I don't think we should be surprised because what they're doing is they're gearing up for the 2016 presidential election. And they know that the public has a short memory. And so they'll praise their support for these popular moderate bills because they know what seems to completely pass the public sometimes is that this country is not a right-wing country. It's actually far from it. Christina, thanks as always for joining us. We'll talk to you next week. Thank you. Christina Mislan is an assistant professor of journalism studies at the Missouri School of Journalism and one of our daily News Flash guest experts. This is Uprising. We'll be right back.